So uh, this is my work with uh, my PhD student, Krzysztof Lorek. Uh, uh, and uh, it's also somehow uh, linked to my previous work with guys from uh, Sweden and, and England. And it's basically about uh, quantum effects in relativity. And I would like to start with a quotation from this nice book by James Hartle. A uh, very, very nice book of uh, like first, first uh, manual like interaction to gravity. And they mention uh, the idea of so-called ideal probe clock, which is a device, hypothetical device that measures proper time along the path. So basically, if you have a clock that moves with constant velocity, special relativity tells you that it's going to be delayed by a certain constant factor depending on velocity. And the same factor, uh, it's the same factor for all possible clocks. So no matter what device you take, if it moves with velocity v, the dynamics is going to be slowed down by the same Lorentz factor. However, if you take a, a clock and make it accelerate, special relativity doesn't really tell you what's going to happen. For example, if you take a pendulum clock, something else is, happen, is going to happen to it, then if you take an iPhone that also has a watch in it. So the mechanism of the clock, can uh, specific mechanism can behave differently for uh, the case of accelerating motion. It's a, a little bit uh, in the contrast with what, what this guy is saying and, and with what most textbooks are saying about that issue. So uh, they are giving a, a formula for proper time, which is basically an integral over time with this Lorentz factor. And let me notice that this expression does not depend on acceleration. I'm going to talk about that in detail. It only depends on instantaneous velocity of a device. And proper time <laughs> is this, this so-called uh, like length of a path in, in, in space time, for a dimensional length. And what this guy is saying that it should be noticed, emphasized, that this expression holds even for accelerating clocks, even when the velocity is dependent on time. So they say that ideal clock, clock can actually measure this thing if it accelerates. And uh, there is a famous test of this relation for an accelerating clock, and it's described on another page. Let me just tell you what the test is. Basically, they have a decaying particle that moves with very high velocity and moves in a circle, basically in the CERN in the uh, accelerator. And moving on a circle means uh, accelerating all the time. And actually, uh, that accelerations, these accelerations are quite high. Uh, the experiment uh, apparently measures accelerations up to 10 to 15 or even more g, which is quite a lot. And uh, apparently the decay rate of a muon is affected by the Lorentz factor exactly according to this formula, and no corrections to that formula are discovered in the experiment, even for accelerations up to 10 to 15 g. So apparently the decaying particles are very good ideal blocks that actually are able to measure this relation. Now, my talk is uh, basically the well, purpose of this part. Perhaps that's not the general case because in the accelerator, v squared is constant. That is true. Yes. Therefore, this is not the general case where you have v that is true. square changing. That is, that is true. So, uh, so I can't uh, actually uh, study this. I, I'm, I'm not studying this example in, in this talk. I'm studying the example of linear accelerating particle. And, uh, the, the purpose of the talk is to show that actually every clock has to break down at some point, and every clock has to eventually depart from this formula, but it's not possible to have a device, physical device, that actually can measure proper time along any path. So uh, uh, the example I'm, 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 uh, what I mentioned before is that, that different clocks will uh, behave differently for uh, the case of acceleration, and uh, you have to ask yourself, how do you have to build a device? Which clock do you, which clock mechanism do you choose to have a device that measures proper time uh, regardless of its acceleration? And one thing I would like to notice is that this formula can't actually derive from special relativity. You can't really derive uh, the rate of accelerating clock. What you are saying is that if you have a clock that moves on a path that is curved, you approximate that, that path with a bunch of straight lines. And you say that on those straight lines, obviously the clock rate is known. It's just uh, 
delayed by the Lorentz factor, but you don't know what's going to happen on those points where the acceleration is, is actually infinite. And you are saying nothing happens there. That the clock is not affected by those points. That's your approximation. And you approximate the real mechanism by saying that it's actually the same as uh, being converted into a bunch of, of straight lines. Yeah, but what's wrong with this uh, formula in the continuous version? Why do we deny the significance of this formula? Because it does not depend on acceleration. In principle, so behavior... What? So, so what? I mean, it's still the proper time. It is the proper time. So that, but that's the mathematical formula. That's the length of the path in space. Right? Yes. But the question is, can you have a device that actually measures it? Which means, can you have a device that is completely insensitive to acceleration? Is it possible? All devices that we know are, depend are affected by acceleration. If, uh, if you take a pendulum clock and make it accelerate, it's, it's broken. What about the elementary particles? Exactly. So, so the most fundamental clock you can think of is the elemental particle that's decaying. If even decaying particle turns out to be affected by acceleration, in contrast to this formula, then I should say that there is no way of building an ideal clock at all. Even if elemental particle that decays and that decays is used as a, as a rate of, 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 of proper time, uh, if it, that is not a good clock, then I guess we can say that there is no way of building a good clock that actually measures this. So this, but, but, yes, uh, this assumption that nothing happens at this point yeah. is uh, the origin of the twin paradox, simply. Because you, in twin paradox you have the same, you have the uh, velocity in one direction, then instantaneous change of the velocity to the opposite one, and then you have twin paradox. So you cannot assume that nothing changes at this point. But exactly. Well, with twin paradox, paradox is a bit, a bit different because well, because you change the uh, the velocity, so <coughs> you are not in the you are not. No, no, no. But in twin paradox, you actually, even if you if you have a twin that measures proper time, there is already a paradox, right? And paradox it's because of this point. Because of this point, yes. yes. But uh, but what I'm saying is that uh, if you have acceleration like that, your clock is not going to measure proper time. It's not going to be even proper time, it has to be something else. It, there has to be corrections that depend on acceleration, and I'm going to show that there must be these corrections. But in the twin paradox, we don't have to introduce such sharp changes. No. It's just two different paths. Yes. When the twins come together, yes. continuously, there will be a twin paradox. Yes, yes, of course. But uh, So, so uh, let me put it this way. In twin par the, the twin paradox appears already when you say that you have two clocks that are able to measure proper time. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying that even measuring proper time is not possible. So, uh, let me just give you one example. I, I always give it to students to, to make them realize that there's actually a problem. But to, to make it completely clear, it's not important that these changes are are uh, discontinuous in no, the, no, the, no. Yeah. I'm, even for continuous yeah. motions there is going to be a problem. So consider a very simple uh, type of motion, a sinusoidal motion when the uh, clock is actually oscillating. So the trajectory is uh, according to this formula, velocity is, is derivative and uh, acceleration is the second derivative. And uh, I can consider the following non-relativistic limit of that motion, where amplitude goes to zero, but frequency goes to infinity, in such a way that the product goes to zero, which means that both position and velocity go to zero. So the clock is technically resting. But I can take the limit in such a way that a times omega squared goes to infinity. I can always find a transition like that. It doesn't have to be infinity. I can make it sufficiently large. That's enough for me. In that case, position is strictly zero. Velocity is strictly zero. Acceleration is singular. It's oscillating very fast with very, very high amplitude. Mm -hmm. And, sorry? And, and A is going to zero. No, but the no, no, amplitude, amplitude of the acceleration is here. Amplitude of acceleration. Okay. A times omega squared goes to infinity, which means that you have a device that is almost at rest, but it actually accelerates like, like crazy. And then you can ask yourself, suppose you have a second clock that is just doing nothing next to it, standing still, and you ask, is the rate of these two clocks going to be exactly the same or not? So if you have a clock at rest, 
and the other one that is accelerating very, very fast, infinitely fast actually, and switching the, the direction of acceleration infinitely fast. And if that's ideal clock, it should work exactly as the one that is standing still. Now, is it possible to have a device that is insensitive to infinite accelerations? I don't know, I think not. Well, actually I know, and I want to show that it's not possible, but this example already should make you doubt a little bit about the possibility of using this formula, because according to this formula, this infinitely accelerating clock should go exactly as the one that is standing still. Because there is no acceleration here, it doesn't care about acceleration. So, um, uh, yeah, the question is, can you measure this? Can you have a device that you, that, that you use to measure this? Now, there is another argument why uh, this is a very good way, I mean, this is this idealized, idea, idealized um, notion of, 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 of time, simply because this expression is invariant under Lorentz transformation. Which means, if I have a path in space-time, maybe it's good if I draw this on the white on the black one. If I have any path in space-time, and um, I measure proper time, or calculate proper time between A and B, I get a number. This number is, is uh, insensitive to Lorentz transformation, which means if I go to another frame of reference and observe the same trajectory from a different frame of reference, which is going to look maybe something like this, so it's the same path but viewed from a different observer, by a different observer, A and B is here. If I can calculate proper time here and proper time here, I get the same number. So people say that ideal clocks must be measuring something that is insensitive to the Lorentz transformation because, well, as all measurements, if you make a measurement get a number, this number cannot depend on the observer who is actually looking at the device. And uh, proper time actually has this property that is uh, invariant under Lorentz transformation. But I'd like to say that this is not the only invariant that characterizes the proper, uh, that, that characterizes the path in space-time. And this is not so well known. Uh, I'm surprised I never found this in any textbook, uh, any textbook. But I can give you a simple example of other invariant along the path that depends on acceleration. So take a, um, for acceleration, which is basically derivative of for velocity over proper time, and take a square of it and integrate it over proper time. Since this square of a, of a four vector is invariant under Lorentz transformation, and proper time is invariant the, over Lorentz transformation, this whole integral is also invariant. Actually, it turns out to be proper acceleration integrated over proper time. Proper acceleration is, ex, ex, proper acceleration, is acceleration experienced by the commoving observer. And if you do simple transformation, you get this integral. Now, this integral also does not depend on the observer. You can Lorentz transform it and you get the same result. So, and more, more than that, this is actually dimensionless. This has no dimension, no physical dimension if you divide it by c squared, or if you divide it by c, it's, it's dimensionless, uh, which means that you can easily modify this formula using that uh, invariant and get some other expression uh, that, is, uh, that is invariant under Lorentz transformation. Which means that you don't have to stick to this formula. Maybe other devices that are insensitive to Lorentz transformation can be built, but they do depending on acceleration. So why, why would you call it time? Well, uh, you, you didn't really explain the basic question. You yes. say that this is not the right formula for time. So what is time? No, no, I'm not saying it's not a good one. Actually, this is the best formula for time. It's this, the assumption that... Yeah. The, the, the common assumption in general relativity is that this is actually time. Mm -hmm. But uh, the question is, you can't, how, how do you measure it? I'm saying you can't really measure it. But what, how do you define time that you want to measure? This way. This way. This way. I'm, tr I'm trying to be the device that measures this, and I can't. Okay. I'm saying that every device is going to measure something different than this. And there is no way of building a mechanism that is going to measure this. So if you want to call this time, I'm happy with that. You have to accept the fact that there is no way, way of measuring it. So in a way, the definition of time this way is not so meaningful. I mean, I'm talking about the range of extreme accelerations. Obviously, in the limit of small accelerations, you can measure it perfectly well. This uh, clock is in a gravitational field, which is, in a way, being accelerated with a small acceleration, and it still measures proper time. So in, within certain limits, it makes sense to talk about, think about this as a measurable quantity that you can call 
time. I'm saying in the future acceleration limit, it's not possible. And uh, the reason for that is very, very simple. Uh, the reason for that is the Unruh effect, which I'm going to tell you about a little bit. The Unruh effect is something that people uh, get interested in uh, a lot uh, these days. But already uh, Richard Feynman uh, was quite interested in that. This is Feynman's blackboard that he left in his office uh, and he never went back from the operation uh, that he took. And somebody took a photograph of, 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 of that blackboard uh, that he left in his office. And uh, he left some, some remarks what he wants to do. For example, he wants to know how to solve every problem that has been solved. That's his, his agenda. But also, on a short uh, time scale, he wanted to learn some, something about uh, other physical effects, like to the whole effect. But also, he wanted to know about something that he uh, named acceleration temperature, which is exactly the Unruh effect I'm going to tell you about. So the Unruh effect is, is, is the following stuff. Imagine that you want to observe a, uh, a photon in a, of a given color, green photon. What it means you have to have a certain device and a certain observer that actually measures with some device that photon and they get certain outcome. But if you get another observer that's moving with constant velocity, he's going to see the same photon of a different color. So if, if, if she sees the green photon, this guy could see a red photon or any other way, uh, doppler, doppler shifted photon. So the photon is still there, but it's going to change the color if you change the, uh, the frame of reference. However, the uh, situation changes dramatically if you replace this other observer that was inertia by a non-inertial observer that accelerates. In that case, this observer not only sees a different color, but he even sees a different number of particles. She can see a single photon, but this observer can see other number of particles. Uh, even if she sees the vacuum, if there's no particles from the perspective of this observer, this guy is going to see some particles. And actually, if you do the math, you find that this guy is going to see a thermal state of particles with the temperature proportional to proper acceleration. That's the Unruh effect. So, I mean, it's, it has very nice, interesting philosophical implications. For example, you you like to think about particles as real objects that are objective somewhere. But uh, those real objects actually depend, their presence depends on, on the observer. So one observer sees them, the other could say that there is no particles, and vice versa. So uh, there is no such thing as an objective object, I mean, objective, whatever, uh, phenomenon that does not depend on observer. Even the particle number depends on observer. So if you have an atom, somebody else could say that there is no atom at all. So, uh, and that's the UNR effect. And not only the vacuum state uh, transforms this in this non trivial way, uh, but every physical quantum, every quantum state actually transforms itself into something else when you go to, if you change the frame of reference in general. And uh, the other effect is the special case when uh, one observer sees, the initial observer sees the vacuum of some quantum field, the other observer is going to see a thermal state full of particles. So let us go back, let, let me just briefly tell you uh, what I want to calculate and then you understand the idea, you, you can leave the talk if you want, because basically you will be able to understand why no ideal works are possible. Suppose that we want to take an, a decaying particle as the most fundamental clock, that, we, that is our candidate to something that measures proper time. What does it mean to have a decaying particle? It is some sort of excitation of a quantum field that interacts with another field, and that interaction uh, leads to certain transition of a state of the initial state to some other final state. For example, you can have, a, you can have two fields. One of them is, uh, has a single excitation, that's your particle. The other field is in the vacuum state. There's no particles. They interact. And after a certain time, there is a probability that your initial particle <coughs> disappeared and reappeared as the excitation of the other field. For example, muon can decay into electron uh, plus some photon. So in QED, this process is more complicated. It involves more than more than two fields, uh, but you can imagine a very simple model of interaction <coughs> when you have two fields and one of them decays into the other one. Now, this decay rate is obviously affected by the initial state. For example, if you have a single excitation of field number one and no particles in the other field, you get a certain decay rate. But if you have this other field being occupied by particles, the decay rate is going to be affected. That's clear. Now, if you have a decaying particle, 
you can calculate the decay rate assuming that the other field is in the vacuum. However, if you make that particle accelerate, from the point of view of that accelerated particle, the other field is not in the vacuum anymore. It's filled with thermal particles. So the decay rate is going to be affected. And since those thermal particles are very, very, I mean, the number of them is very small, uh, for small accelerations, you don't experience that. As long as you accelerate not too much, so that the Unruh effect is not evident, you are not going to see any effect of that. However, if you turn on very strong accelerations, the accelerated particle is going to experience the surrounding field as a thermal state, and the decay rate is going to be clearly affected. But the problem with decaying particles is that the decaying particle is not a well-defined state. It depends on history. This is just a resonance. Not and a resonance is not a state, but it simply continues. So in other words, the definition of the initial state is a little bit ambiguous. Of yes. course, uh, there's, this is a problem. So that's why people do S, uh, S, like S, S, S matrix uh, formalism in, in particle physics to avoid those problems. And what I'm studying here is the long time. But this is on an approximation. Yes, this is an approximation, of course. So, so what I'm going to count, I'm going to go into details of that. But I'm, as, I'm calculating the decay, the decay rates for long interaction times. So uh, I, I assume that I have a certain initial state, and then I calculate the uh, interaction and I calculate probability of some, some process and going to of exponential decay. Uh, or power uh, law. Yes. Well, but it, that's a bit different. I'm, I'm taking the per perturbation here, obviously. Yes, and right. I'm going to the so, the, so the decay rate is fairly yes. insensitive to this. Yes. Definition yes. of the yes. initial condition. So the probability of the case is very the short Z naught part and the and the polynomial part of the algebraic part which are dependent. So in the regime I'm, I'm looking at is uh, that probability of the case linear in time. So uh, it's exponential. Uh, no, no, it's the uh, the decay rate is constant. Yes. <coughs> and that leads to exponential decay. Uh, yes, yes. I mean there is a subtle thing, but probability. Yes, it's, it's that the, the perturbation well, the regime. The point is that, strictly speaking, for a very short time, yes, it is not 1 minus gamma t. Mm -hmm. well, there is a deviation. Yes, yes, I know. I know what you mean. Leading to this quantum zero. Yes. Well, you, you don't necessarily recover that when you. Uh, that depends also on the model of, of decay that you have. But and for long times, again, again it, it, it is, is, it is tricky, yes. yes. So let me tell you about it. So basically the idea is again this. If you make if you take any object that has certain dynamics, could be a decaying particle or anything else, you make it accelerate. At some point this accelerating object is going to experience a thermal state around mm -hmm. it. And that's inevitable. The more you accelerate, the higher the temperature. And eventually that temperature takes over all processes. But the main problem now that you encounter is what do you mean by accelerating the particle? How do you accelerate it? What kind of force you apply to it to accelerate it? And this will be the crucial problem. Yeah. Because so this will certainly depend on the way you accelerate the body. How do you accelerate the muon? Yes, good point. Um, applying, applying a certain field. The field means that there is an exchange of photons, etc. So, but that even adds more problems to what I'm already no, saying. I, I think this is the main problem because when you think of acceleration in classical terms, you visualize this, that you have a rope and you pull by this rope yes. and the uh, vessel accelerates. But yes. for a particle, you cannot do that. Of course. You have, you have to you have, so you have to even go one step back and say, what is the acceleration mechanism? And that will depend on the acceleration mechanism. I, I absolutely agree. So. Uh, so I you, should, you should take a more or less realistic model. Let's let's even take the simplest one when you have electric field, which you apply, and then you have a model for acceleration. Well, if you want, so let me put it this way: if you do that, which you can do obviously, you get in, into even more serious problems that I'm saying. So I say that even if you forget about these problems, these practical issues, you already run into troubles trying to measure properly. If you actually try to be more specific and more physically correct, you get more problems. For example, you want to switch on constant electric field to accelerate the charged particle. You have to have very, very strong electric field to accelerate it very, very strong. 
which means that you have to have very, very strong energy, energy densities in your electric field, which is going to inevitably create some extra particles out of the vacuum because the energy density is, is just going to, high, going to be too high. So, uh, in a way, that is going to even to, to bring down your mechanism even stronger than what I'm saying. Because if you, if you just crank up the electric field too much, yes, it creates antiparticles and particles, yes. and that distorts all the interactions. Yeah. So you could also try to think about classical potential then. Suppose you have a particle in classical potential, and treat the <laughs> potential classically, and somehow change the potential, make the potential accelerate. That could be something. So maybe else. that indicates that there is no answer to this question. Yes. Because you cannot realize it. Yes, that's exactly my point. That's exactly my point. I'm saying that these problems already appear on this level, but there are even more serious problems or more severe problems that need to be taken into account. And the message of this talk is that uh, <coughs> uh, despite the optimism of uh, James Hartle, who said that uh, proper time can be measured and that has been proven up to accelerations 10 to 15 g, I'm saying that if you uh, increase a few more orders of magnitude, because I would expect that already at 10 to 18 g, you already start to see the problem deviations. Uh, uh, despite of the optimism of the author, I'm saying that uh, it's not possible to measure that quantity. And you just have to forget about the idea of time, of measuring time for higher scales. Uh, what does it mean physically? I don't know. Because Why do you want to measure this? Uh, you measure physical effects. Well, yes, so you want to say that uh, time is not a physical effect that someone says. No, no, it is. It appears in various contexts. For example, it appears as a lifetime of a muon. Yes. And you can measure the lifetime of a muon when muon is being accelerated. Yes. And that's a physical problem, and I don't see why is that. Uh, regardless of the implication, <coughs> it's kind of interesting that the accelerating muon decays differently than just a uh, yes. muon. I think it is interesting. Uh, the consequences are very serious because if you can't measure time, you probably can't measure, measure space as well, because these things are related. And uh, what I'm saying is that physics of uh, non-inertial frames, extremely non-inertial frames, is probably going to be completely different from what we know uh, in our presence when the... Yeah, that's because uh, the theory is not invariant under uh, such transformations. That's a very simple question. There is no theory that you can apply here. I mean, well, there is theory. If Field you, theory does not apply to accelerated frames of reference. Because it's not invariant <coughs> under general no, 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 but, but the transformations. Uh, How, so you cannot say what is the value. Well, I, I think the Hawking effect and the Lunar effect and Casimir, dynamical Casimir effect and many other effects are based on the assumption that you actually can take quantum field theory and put it on the non inertial frame of reference. So people believe, well, those people believe that to some degree you can actually do it. You yeah, can Hawking, take No, the Hawking effect is something different because the whole system is stationary. There's no, no time. No, it's not there's no time dependence in the metric. There is. What? The metric is. No, no. Hawking time what, dependence. How, how, in Hawking's calculation, he has a cloud of dust that is collapsing. And that's the that's that's that, that's that, that's 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 <laughs> The original Hawking idea yeah. was that when you have a horizon, then particles are being produced. In the original Hawking's paper. Yeah, are no, 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 the ori original Hawking's paper is dealing with the collapsing dust. And he specifically says why he does not consider uh, eternal black hole. There, there, there are good reasons for not doing that. It's, it's actually more complicated to consider eternal black hole than the collapsing stuff. Simply because you can't, you don't know how to choose the initial state. The, the boundary condition. Yes. And when you have collapsing dust, there are uh, boundary conditions in the past and in the future, so you can, you can use that. So, uh, uh, so Hawking actually believed that he can take quantum field theory, put it on extremely curved space then, where you have a similarity in it, and still do your quantum field theory calculations. So obviously, uh, we don't have certainty that that uh, still works. The theory still works, could be breaking down, we don't know. But, uh, Certainly, there is no clear uh, way of saying that this cannot be applied. We don't have an experimental data for it. So as, 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 long we don't have, as long as we don't have experimental data, we just assume that we can apply the theory to, uh, to the context that, have, that we have never tested the theory for. And we, some of us believe that it works. 
that, and that belief leads to owner effect, that belief leads to uh, improvisation of the issues. So I'm going to, to ask, take that assumption and say that already that assumption leads to the problems that I uh, heuristically argue for. So, yeah, so I'm considering a very simple model of, uh, of a decaying particle. I'm considering two fields, two scalar fields. One of them is massive, one of them is massless for, for the sake of, uh, due to some technical issues I don't want to go into. Uh, so I have two quantum fields. Uh, one of them I'm denoting with capital phi and capital quantities, and the other has a decomposition to plane waves and uh, annihilation operators with small letters. These are free. Yeah, these are free, free fields. And I'm switching on the interaction of the most simple form I can think of, basically a product of two fields and some uh, coupling constant. So really there is no interaction because you can diagonalize this whole thing in quadratic still. So you, you just change the modes and that's all. Yes. Uh, well but you call it well but this is this is the interaction. <coughs> quadratic. But, but this is not really interaction. You you have two coupled harmonic oscillators and that is equivalent to a harmonic oscillator. Okay, why do I call that that there is interaction? If I have a single excitation in one of those plane waves, this is the layer of the base yes. when there is no interaction. If I have a single particle in, in this one of those plane waves, then yeah. it's not the ideal mode of the whole system. Yes, you should yes. use ideal mode of the whole system. Yes. Yeah. But uh, well, so you cannot have decays in this setting because this is not you, well. You can have a decay if you interpret a particle as an excitation of that mode. But these modes are not visible because you back. have coupling. Well, hmm? no, it depends it on the measure. It's, not, really it's a not necessarily going to come back because. Uh, Eventually. This is like two coupled pendula. Yeah. Uh, well, so infinite numbers. Yeah, infinite numbers. So yeah, infinite number. numbers. So if you yeah. so the theta, the theta are photons which go which goes to infinity. But you say that you, you want to square somewhere to make it more. Of course, yeah. If you want to have real interaction, of course, yes. it's just two. The reason I'm not, not not making it more realistic. Well, if I wanted to make it realistic, I would just take QED and sure. make a real interaction. It's just I want to show something much. This is no, no, but I'm afraid that in this model you don't <coughs> really see what is important to you. Well, I think I do. You think I think there is no decay. Well, let's see what. No, no, but the situation is not so bad, I think, because one field is massless <coughs> and the second field is mass. Less mass. Yeah. So it is not uh, as simple as you say. Because uh, then it is still it is still a quadratic. Oh. System. Yes, it is quadratic, but if lambda is. But it is almost correct. Polar electrons are of the yes. same type. Exactly. It's a mass, mass with massive and so on. You still can diagonalize. You still have. Yes, yes, it can be diagonalized. Yeah, sure. No, no. You can that's not I unusual mean, at all. You can diagonalize. You can diagonalize. That, that's I agree. But so yeah. there is no decay. Well, if you, depending on what you call a particle. If yes. you call a particle excitation yes, of your sure. eigenmode yes. of that system, then there is no decay. You are absolutely right. But if you take a particle to be an excitation of this mode, yeah, there are three. But it will come back. It will decay. Eventually. Uh, yeah. But yeah. it will be a very long time. Until yeah. it. Yeah. So, so not, this time is actually. So, so this is the it's phenomenon which has a closed system, for example, yes. and we do not bother yes. too if, much if, with that. If that field is quantized in a box, if they are both quantized in a box of the same size, then they are going to be yes. Yes. But if this is a free field with no boundary conditions, then there is no going. The revival time is in there. So, but the sum is not sum. Yes, yes. So the sum, the sum is uh, just uh, symbolic. <coughs> so again, it's not a realistic model because, there, well, first of all, there are no uh, useful massive fields that interact in this way. It's just a model of, of the interaction. I'm arguing that the same thing you would get in QED if you do a proper hardcore QED calculation. It's just uh, going to be more time. -saving time-consuming and, and it takes more effort, but the effect is going, the qualitative answer is not going to change. And I'm going to show this qualitative answer just to show you what's going to happen roughly with this type of interaction. You, can, you, got, you are going to clearly see what would happen if you take more serious interaction of other types. So uh, what, what we are doing, we, we are taking this, we are taking first order perturbation expansion, and what we calculate is the probability of a transition from the 
uh, single excitation of one field to whatever in the final state provided that there is no particle in the initially excited field. And I'm going to, to bring up some, some extra problems that could, uh, should be taken into account. First of all, <coughs> are you restricting yourself to lambdas for which the whole thing is bounded from below? Um, if it's lambda is sufficiently small, it's always bounded from below. That's right. Yes. But if it's sufficiently large, then it, it will collapse. Yes, will yes, just, yes. Yeah. But there's one more thing I haven't discussed yet. When you think about particle, you think about a localized object. And when you, I draw this line here, it's a path of a clock. But no real particle can take a path, simply because there are no point-like particles. I mean, electrons are considered to be point-like particles, but they always are localized within a wave packet. That is actually spreading. Even if you forget about the spreading, you can't localize, you can overlock, you can't overlocalize an electron simply because if you try to squeeze it too much, mm -hmm. you put again too much energy in a single point, and the density of energy becomes so high that you create particles and antiparticles. Yes. So you are going to destroy your clock as you try to shrink it. So you can't shrink your electron too much. You have to have a balance. So that means that the electron or your clock doesn't actually go on a path, it goes on a smeared path. It's actually spreading. And even if there is a way to avoid that spreading, I'm going to talk about that, it's not a single path. And moreover, if you want the size of the electron, of the clock, to be fixed in a way you want the electron to be rigid from its own point of view, it means that both different elements of that wave path it has to undergo paths that have different proper accelerations. So there's actually a bunch of trajectories you have to consider. That, that are bounded, they are characterized by different proper accelerations, and uh, you see things are more complicated. You can't localize it too much because you break down your clock, but you can't localize it too little because then there is no single path for you to, to characterize. So there is some sort of trade-off between those things, and those, all those effects you have to take into account of that type of calculation. So uh, since I I don't want to, I want to make life really simple, I don't want to bother with the spreading. I'm assuming that the particle actually is put in a box and that box is accelerating. The box is classical, it has a certain boundary condition and I accelerate the whole box. And there is particle inside. And the control over the size of the particle, I have that control by controlling the size of the box. And that's basically the idea. So what I'm doing, I'm placing one of those particles in a box there's a single excitation inside the box. The other field is free. The, bo the, the box is transparent to that other field, and those two fields simply interact. And I'm calculating a propagate transition of... But what happens to energy and momentum conservation? If one particle is massive, it should never decay into massless particles. Yeah, well, because of the energy and momentum. That is obviously true. You, you can't... A photon can be absorbed by an electron. But why do you expect a momentum conservation? Because there is... No external force. There is, because you make the particle accelerate. No, no, but you s without acceleration, yes. there is no decay. Uh, particle cannot decay because of the... Uh, no, it is it is not if you have a, a particle at rest that is massive, it only means that you are going to have a symmetric decay into right and to left. Right? So no. What do you mean? It decays into one particle, not two. Two particles. Yeah, but there is amplitude for the particle to be greater to the right and to the left. No, that's not the way it works. So you say that two particles will... So if the case into two particles, that would require... Five yes, in QED you'd have to have that process on shell, right? Uh, but this is this is not the case. So again, you, you violate that, that one 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 thing. You may not like that so much, I guess. It's, but it's not a physical you, process, yes. But no. you cannot get it from the calculation. The calculation, if you do it properly, will preserve the energy conservation law. What? The momentum conservation. Okay, let, let, me, let me tell you what I'm calculating is basically. That's a very good point, actually. I can have talked about that. Um, of course, if you have short time, then you don't have to conserve energy because of the uncertainty principle. Yes. So, but, but if you wait until the things settle, then you see that there is no decay. 
let me, let, me, let me say what I'm doing. I'm taking the evolution operator, which is basically e to the minus i h t. I'm expanding it to the first order, 1 minus i h t. And then I'm calculating the probability of the amplitude of this force. I'm taking the first field to be a single excitation of a certain mode mm -hmm. of the cavity, the ground mode of the cavity, I'm calling it one zero, and the vacuum of the other field. I'm putting here this evolution operator, and I'm calculating here zero in the first field, and whatever in the other field. <coughs> then I'm calculating the probability, which is a square of this, and I'm summing over all betas. So if this is A, then I'm calculating sum over beta. Then the families go to the loop. Yeah, exactly. And I'm just doing this calculation, I get something. Obviously that violates the conservation sure, of... because you are... It even violates conservation of probability. Yes. Yes. Well, well simply because it's a perturbation here. Yes. Yeah. How can it not violate it? But, but um, again, it's, it's not a proper calculation you really want to do that represents physical process. Yeah. But still, the, 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 the way I'm doing the calculation will... Plus this next transparency will show explicitly that there is an, if, an effect that is going to be present in every possible modification of that calculation to take into account proper no, if physical you, If you really do it correctly, with the entirety preserved, then you don't see this. Uh, yes, that is true, in this moment. Yes. Well, there are no, first of all, there are no fields on that type. You could already say that this is not physical because there are no scalar fields. Uh, no, but the main problem is this quadratic calculation. If you had two particles, if you had small phi square, then, then it, it can decay into two. I think it would not be so difficult to modify it from the squares. It's just, it was if you simple. are using perturbation theory, it would not be difficult. Yes, it would not. <coughs> but uh, uh, because this is a quadratic so you, uh, model in any case, so you can calculate it exactly as so. Yes. Yes. If you want. You yes. Don't need to use I mean, uh, you can calculate it exactly easily if the number of modes is countable uh -huh. that only involve uh, some numerical summation. Okay. If, the, if in the continuous limit <coughs> transition, it's to some degree it's also possible. In the continuous limit transition, it's even easier. Is it? Yes. The you use the Laplace transform and you look for the holes. Uh, it's, it's, it's a standard calculation. Okay. The problem, of course, then is that the Hamiltonian is not bounded from below. It is yes, bounded in for certain lambdas. No, no. For small lambdas, it is. Lambdas has to be. Phi squared and phi will, is not bounded. Ah, no, no, we are talking about this uh, phi phi. Ah, I'm talking about phi squared. No, we are talking about with phi phi. Still, okay. stay with this model. But then there are problems uh, here with this energy momentum conservation. Look, uh, this is just a toy model. Just think about well, it as a toy model. model should Please preserve uh, every time model breaks energy. down for that reason or other. I mean, no, no, but not the basic law of energy momentum conservation. <laughs> okay, but yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to modify it uh, just, just for, for that to be like uh, not to have that problem, but I'm saying that the result is not going to qualitatively change. And let me let me let me show you what was the result. So, uh, this gamma n is the transition from the uh, this is basically a summation of an all possible rate transition from this state <coughs> to anything else. So this gamma is what I call A here in the language. And when the crook is at rest, this is the answer you are going to get. Now, where is the clock here? What do you do? I'm calculating the probability of transition. Yes, but uh, you are calculating it in two cases. So what's yes. the second case? In the first case, the first case the the assumes that the, the box is in the vacuum. The, the box, vacuum. The box is the vacuum. Uh, little phi is in the vacuum and in the other yes. that, that it's in this unroof thermo. In, in the other case, well, in the other case, yes. the, the outside <coughs> field is actually in the vacuum state of the Minkowski observer. Yes. But from the perspective of the accelerated box, yes. it's a thermal state. It's a ther unroof vacuum. It's, a, it's, a, it's an unroof thermal state. Put in other words, the other thing is just the decay in the presence of thermal field. Yes. So not, not so complicated. Really. Sure. <coughs> so, uh, but and, and you can you can now imagine that if I modify the expression, these formulas are not going to be affected at all. It's only that those gammas are going to be different, and those gammas are going to be different. But those expressions that I wrote on this transparency are going to be preserved. So you can change your Hamiltonian to your favorite one. 
You can even go to QED or anything else. And plug in directly those expressions. You just have to replace gammas with the appropriate probability transitions. What is not going to change is the presence of this term, which is crucial for this topic. And if you actually do the calculation for that model, you get certain uh, numbers here. And in the limit of long interactions, this number is going to be proportional to t, which is basically saying that the decay rate is, is constant. So if you do the, if you extend it to uh, continuous limits, you get, you get the exponential decay here. And when you have accelerated case, you have also linear dependence on the proper time, but with a different proportionality constant that depends on acceleration. Alpha is proper acceleration. And you can't get rid of it. For small, level, for small accelerations, this term is negligible, and you approximately have the same thing here and here. Just replacing two with proper time is good enough. Is there some additional constant here? This is some constant depending on mass, it's a complicated term of No, 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 but in the exponent. Uh, it should be dimensionless. This is dimensionless, yes. Omega is uh, frequency and yes, alpha is acceleration. Yeah, if C is equal to 1, this is dimensionless. Ah, C is. C is equal So, uh, but this is obviously dimensionless. And uh, since omega depends on this, it's the ground level of the, of the box, ground energy level of the box, it depends on the size of the box. So this correction depends on both acceleration and the size of the box. And even in the limit of very small size of the box and sufficiently high accelerations, that correction is not trivial. Which means that it's not simply enough to replace T with tau. You always get something else. Now, I, 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 I'm using a specific uh, model of interaction to, to make it evident, but we also did calculations for other semi-classical approaches like using Ulr the read detectors, we always get similar thing. So in a way this is pretty general observation. That this term is inevitable in whatever type of interaction theory you want to use. But how do you find the modes in the accelerated box? Ah, because uh, the uniformly accelerated box has a very nice the real frame of reference is very convenient. No 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 no. Because acceleration in the real picture goes forever. Therefore, it cannot be used to define the space of the system. No, no, because it's not forever, it can be used to define space. No, that's the question we were... Yes, yes, and I, 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 I always this have... This is a very unphysical situation. You said that the box that you have drawn here is a box that is moving not with constant acceleration all the time, but it vibrates somehow. No, no, the one I'm, I'm actually considering here is the one that accelerates uniformly. All the time? Well, from zero to t, for, for the integration origin, like uh, that domain. In order to use these modes in the Rindler space, you must have acceleration that lasted forever. Uh, as, 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 so, as, soon as, as long as I'm calculating the probability transition within the range of times that are finite, it doesn't really matter what the mode, hap what, what the mode happens to be after that. So, uh, I still don't see how you define the modes in a uniform well, system. That is not we have been going through the discussion for many times, and I always have an impression that I somehow managed to convince you for a while, but then it doesn't last long. No, because you have all these paradoxes that the space is split into two pieces, and yeah, well, there is a horizon, and all these unphysical effects are there because you assume that acceleration is lasting. Well, in a way, you could say that inertia is all the kind of... Could you take oscillating box, for example? Yes, the result would be exactly the same. No, yes, you could. It cannot be exactly the same because it's... I can easily... I can, what, I, what I can do, for example, let me... <laughs> I, because then, when you have oscillating box, you have, for example, dynamical Casimir effect. Yes, and I did actually do explicitly what you... Are you the physical thing to do? And I did the calculations on many occasions. You can take a box that moves along an oscillating uh, trajectory, yes. and goes with acceleration for a finite time, then stops, then accelerates back for a finite time, and stops accelerating. And you can actually uh, continuously uh, merge those, those elements and make the modes, uh, you can stick the, the modes together in a way, you can combine them together. 
to, to have a simple to have a evolution that uh, corresponds to oscillating box, and that's that's but this is time dependent system. There are no modes in the usual sense. No, there are no modes. So what because you, everything is time dependent. This is going to uh, this is going to be off topic, but uh, I, can, I can tell you roughly what was the mecha what the method of that is going to be applied. So uh, I need a precise diagram. You have a time dependent on what you can do, you can consider a resting cavity that starts to accelerate at some point for a finite time, the way you like it. Then the acceleration stops on a plane of simultaneity of the real frame of reference that will be here. Yes, but how do you find the modes during this acceleration period? Well, what is the meaning of modes in this case? First of all, you can, what you need because to do, you, you have to take a quantum field in this part of space time and to decompose them to any family of orthogonal modes could be eigenmodes but they don't, they don't even have to be eigenmodes at all. You only have to decompose the field in any way that, is that, you, that you choose that guarantees that it's complete. You have to find any complete decomposition of the field operator in this region. You have a complete decomposition into plane waves here. You have a complete decomposition into plane waves here where you move with constant velocity. Here you can use the uh, the read that and there is some transition matrix which yeah. describes the yeah. dynamical so, so effect. Exactly. So you can, for example, so so you, you can you can you can take any kind of composition here. It doesn't have to be doesn't have to be anything really. It can be anything. We we actually can choose it to be a reader mode truncated to that type of space time because it's complete. Then what you need to do is calculate the volume of the No, it's not complete over all space. No, that's here. But uh, you describe the field on the inside the car. But the state in quantum physics is described everywhere. Otherwise, you don't. But, but the physical, what we are looking at is the content of the box. We don't care about what is outside. If you are interested and in what are the boundary conditions? On the box? Could be uh, the one that we are using here, the Dirichlet boundary conditions. The, the wave function vanishes. Yes, and in that case, the Hilbert space outside is. It's is decoupled. Yeah. So what you need to do is calculate Bogolio transformation from this base to this base, then calculate Bogolio free evolution here, and Bogolio transformation here, and you can calculate the final state, and you can convince yourself that uh, you can take any limit, whether it's long-term acceleration or short-term acceleration, you can calculate that explicitly, and you say that you can see the transition smooth. If you make this go to infinity, there is no sharp transition. There is no non-physical effect happening at infinity. It's like a smooth transition. Already when the acceleration is short, you already see the evidence of the dynamical cutting effect or some other manifestation because of the, of the Yeah, yeah. Are being created. So, so let's, for the record, let's assume that I have convinced you for a while to this. So, but we have particle creation that it's uh, not easy to say what you mean by <coughs> decay. Because the yes. number of particles changes so, so, anyway. So in this particular model of interaction that I was talking about, I, I'm assuming a transition from 1 to 0 of the mode of the uh, free field decomposition. And which is not the diagonal one for the Hamilton. And at what time? Before the... So I start at a time equal 0 and I finish at some large time t. Well, I can calculate for any time I want, but I know that for short times it's not really physical. If you want to go to the golden, golden rule regime, you have to take t to be large. For small times, it's actually quadratic in T. Yes. For large times, it's The golden rule is valid for stationary systems, not when the Hamiltonian changes with time. Mm -hmm. Well, golden rule you can apply for the time dependent perturbation as well. Yeah. No, no, but here, the meaning of the particle changes when you go along this. That is true. But, uh, uh, yes, but. but does, I don't see that be harmful to, to the, this, this analysis I'm doing here. Well, again, uh, I don't have anything against doing the same calculation. I, I, don't, I, I don't want to be too defensive about, uh, about uh, the particular model of interaction I have chosen, because this is not relevant. Sorry. But maybe you can engineer this model in such a way that those two numbers will be equal, maybe. If you have different things. Well, yeah, I just wanted to talk about that. Yeah, give me a second. Sorry, I have to go through those animations. 
I'm not defensive about that at all. I mean, I, I, I take all the criticism, I understand this is, uh, this is just a toy model with all its flaws, but I don't really care, because what I care about is this transparency. And uh, I don't care about how do you calculate those gamma. It could be a more complicated way of doing that in other models, but they are still going to be there. And that's crucial. This is the, the point of the talk. So you can change the model to your favorite, you still get the same qualitative effect. <coughs> Now, uh, what does it really mean? Because we are considering a simple case of uniform accelerated box with a single particle in it, and we calculate the decay of that particle, and we assume that to be our clock. And we see that there is no uh, simple transformation. You can't take a stationary box and just replace it with that. It doesn't work. It breaks down at some point, and those uh, accelerations where that appears actually are Two, roughly two orders of magnitude above the level of the experiments that I mentioned uh, begin, in, the, in the beginning, although that, that experiment did not have a linear acceleration, only have a, a circular acceleration. I mean, uh, there is a centrifugal force that uh, makes particles go around in circles. So it's not exactly the same thing, but uh, in a way, the level of, of accelerations is, is comparable. So probably if you accelerate a little bit more, you would already see some, some deviations from the, from the ideal formula. But uh, somebody asked, can you compensate for that? If you know the rate, why not just taking your clock and you just have to uh, regauge it somewhere, you know, you know it. Of course. But if you know the path in advance, you know what effect to expect, you don't need a clock at all. If you know the path, you can just calculate your proper time, you don't need a clock for that. Yes. The idea of a clock is to have a device that you take on a known trajectory and get an outcome that tells you something about the trajectory that you, don't, that you didn't know before. It's supposed to measure the time along any trajectory you choose. Yes, if, if correct, you, correcting this uh, outcome afterwards, after you, you understand what physical, uh, what the physics of the clock really was, but that's not a problem at all for me. I mean, the fact that sometimes the quantities you measure need to be corrected because you realize that the physics was more complicated. But, but you use the measurement device to measure things that you didn't know. If you know that you are going to measure something with your device and you know what the outcome is going to be, you know, I can suppose that I have a certain complicated measurement and I know that the answer is going to be five. Then I can build a device that measures that. I can simply take a student, put him in a box, I will throw him a piece of uh, empty paper and give him a pen and he writes five on that paper and gives me back the, 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 the card with five written on it. That's my measurement device, right? It's going to give me the correct answer. But that's not what devices are for. I mean, he's supposed to, if I change the conditions of the experiment, he's still going to give me five, uh, whereas it's not a good outcome anymore. So your clock would have to be corrected for any path uh, individually. Uh, and for that, for that case, you don't need a clock at all. If you, if you know the path, you can just calculate it. The clock is supposed to measure you the proper time along the unknown path. And certainly, even for it, the simplest case, case of uniform acceleration, there are problems. I don't even want to think what happens if you have non-uniform acceleration. That's going to be even more complicated. So uh, in that case, you don't know what to do. You know, even the calculation is difficult. <coughs> so uh, in a way, I would say that, uh, again, at some point when those correction terms become relevant, things break down. What is small here in what units is this model? The unit of uh, well, the characteristic. Uh, oh, was the wavelength of the uh, No, no, the, 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 the length, the, the characteristic quantities are length of the cavity of acceleration. So alpha times L over C has to be small. Then you don't see it. Relative to acceleration. Yes. L is the length of the, of the box of the size of the This is not dimensional. This is dimensional. Wait, wait, C squared. C squared. Oh, yes. So that's basically it. The conclusion of the talk is very simple. It's this. So you can still keep in mind that uh, all general relativity is actually based on covariant derivatives that are, roughly speaking, derivative with respect to some quantities like proper time. Which means that if you don't have a way to measure that, uh, 
talking about physics that is unmeasurable, it's not really physics anymore. So we can ask to what degree it makes sense to talk about extreme non-inertial situations, knowing that you can't really measure them if you only have quantum devices. Classically, you can measure proper time. Because you can have an idealized device that measures proper time. In the real world, it's not possible. But that's quite an interesting conclusion. Like you really have to think about uh, what are you doing in physics, especially in, in gravity, uh, to what degree it makes sense to talk about that when there is no way of measuring even such a simple thing as a proper time or, or proper okay, That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. May I answer your question? I don't know who's coming to charge. Sure. Okay. Always. So the, there is additional interesting aspect to what you were uh, talking about. This UNRU radiation, since it's a thermal state, means that for the realistic decaying system, the decay would be incomplete. In other words, even when T goes to infinity, there would be some probability of remaining in the excited state for the actuation and decay. So there is even probability of excitation in that course. That's right. That's right. That's right. So, which is even more exotic here. Yes. yes. So, uh, it's funny that those 10 to 15 Gs that were realized in the CERN experiment were only, I think, two or three orders of magnitude below the threshold where you actually see the UNRU effect. So, I'm actually kind of interested in now maybe going to more realistic cases of actual QED calculation with, within a rotating frame of reference where you actually can see or predict where those effects will take over and maybe think about an experiment. I don't know. So, you need to yeah. so like. <laughs> no, 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 those experiments were made like 30 years ago or so. They so are kind of LJC would, would, would clearly uh, make it possible. Like Yeah, okay. One remark and another will also be a remark. So remark number one, let's begin with this formula. You can imagine that you write uh, number one between the integral and the square root. Yes. Then the, you use the formula for partial integration, change this one into t, and differentiate the square root. And this way you get another formula for the proper time, which actually exclusively <coughs> depends on a acceleration. Oh no, well, there is a boundary term that if you take into account, yes, yes, it cancels out. Like so. that saying that something does not depend on acceleration is uh, a bit ambiguous. No, no, to no. Very I don't agree. Back. This is unambiguous. This does not depend on acceleration. You have to the, the whole thing, so the pass from the, uh, with the fixed boundaries and the, in the, in the integral does not depend. So this is yes. yes. So, so in a way, that, that example I gave with an accelerate, accelerated clock, According to this formula, yeah. the two clocks are going to give the same rate, whatever, if you can do your, your partial integration, it's still not going to change the answer. Yeah. Uh, okay, and the second remark is, is so you have proved that measuring proper time using uh, particle physics has certain uh, limitations for very large accelerations of wave rate. That's true, but you can say it's about measuring of distance. For example, in very high temperatures, you cannot use. Um, a ruler to measure distances because the ruler evaporates. For example, yes. But it does not mean that um, the notion of distance has to be revised in physics or. I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure because the notion of distance is only based on our experience in reality because we know how to measure it. You know why we use, use this? For example, you can imagine a situation where distance between Warsaw and Krakow is fluctuating by large magnitudes. If, that ha if the reality was that way, if the space time was independent, you would not even introduce the notion of distance, it doesn't make sense. If Excuse five me, minutes later it's, 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 it's even worse than that. It's not well defined. Because what yes. you mean by the distance of the force yes. 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 uh, It's culture. not well defined, yeah. And but approximately it's well defined for the yes. uh, like range of experience you are still so, so in the case of, of your <laughs> evaporating rule, <laughs> you're absolutely right. It doesn't make sense to the two part more distance if you can't measure it. I mean,
and so certainly if there can be those things about the community as well. It's the same problem. I think that the main problem here that you encounter is that you are trying to use the classical formula and apply it to part quantum particles. There is no way to define velocity for a quantum particle. It's not a well-defined concept. It's yeah. only true yes. in the classical. So, so, so the way I did that is this is again a semi-classical approximation when you actually have a mirror, a classical boundary condition that you can keep under control. So you said that. You are right that in order to accelerate a particle, you need actually a field or some sort of external potential. Like and then velocity does not. Yes, what, what we are having is we are having a box. And you assume that the boundary conditions hold. And we can actually modify them, we can make the box and shape it classically. So that is a classical element that's, that's you, standing behind the, the formulas. But here, when you apply it to quantum field confined <coughs> boundaries, yes. the approximation that you can treat it. The boundary is classically fails. Of course. So that's also, but, but already within the, that approximation, the whole thing fails. So if you have, if you want to add some more failures to that, I agree there is more. For example, the boundary, the box is enough to have one failure. Failure is that you are using this formula, which is classical, and apply it to quantum objects. Is there any quantum I mean, theory no which is relativistic and of interacting particles, but no which is working? Which is field theory, where velocity is not. And, and this is an interacting field and it is working and you can do something more than perturbation expansion? Okay, let me, let me put it this way. We are using our theories with boundary conditions and stuff within certain regimes. We don't know what's outside those regimes. I'm saying that if you take that theory and assume that yes. you can apply it in outside of our regime, it already gives, to a gives you a failure. Then clearly you can imagine that if the real theory that needs some modification of, of, of it in order to be applied to, to to the regime that I'm considering here, the, you, you, you don't want to miraculously re like re reappear the, the proper time in, in, in your uh, measurement scheme. You, you, this, this, this notion of proper time is probably gone forever. Even if you modify your theory, you wouldn't expect that somehow it recovers the ability to measure proper time. So, uh, uh, yeah, the, the question is proper time of what? Did you say proper time? And you define it along its trajectory. There's yes. no trajectory in quantum. I agree. Yes. So, 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 so the, this the whole notion of proper time loses its meaning. That's the technical data I didn't mention. Uh, what we are considering is a uniformly accelerated box, and the proper time is the proper time of the inside of the box, exactly the line inside the, in the middle of the box. But that does not uh, correspond, to correspond to the particle. Of course. That's what I said before, that uh, the, the concept of, of math doesn't make sense in quantum theory. But uh, we could maybe expect that all somehow approximately the, the path makes sense. But uh, even if you assume that approximately the path makes sense, you can't measure the, the length of the path because the mechanism breaks down. It is like a hopeless project because in order to have these extreme accelerations, yeah. you must really have particles, that not uh, classical objects. Yes, but the purpose of like this topic is the war. You have many problems before you can treat them. Yes, yes, but the purpose of the talk is exactly to show, to show, to show that. That even if you forget about many problems, you get others that take over. So I agree, the project is hopeless. Okay, but this is the same problem as this guy, so we can go to the guys of LHC and say you are not accelerating clearly particles because there are no particles, yes? They believe they do accelerate particles and collide particles. So this is within this framework. This, 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 this yes. was his. They have very, very large accelerations there. Yes. And uh, they still believe it's just particles. They still, the they still believe that there are particles which are colliding. Y no? Yeah, even more. They go back and forth between a uh, lab frame and yes. moving frame. Yeah? Yeah. Which is exactly, which is exactly what he is doing here. So, so, so this is definitely not a problem of Dragon, but a problem of theory. Okay, I would yeah. agree. Otherwise, the theory which are, they are using in this LHC is also completely... Uh, they are using classical theory to mm -hmm. describe trajectories. Yes. 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 yes, yes, and it works. And it works. It works because at high energy, this is a very good approximation. But the point is that one cannot treat fundamental problems in an approximate way. That, that is something which may lead to these paradox. Well, in a way you can't... Uh, they talk about any fundamental problems then because always have been our approximation.
The point is that approximation should not spoil the fundamental question. Yes, I, I know, I, I understand your point, but in a way I'm trying to say that within all our knowledge, there is no way of thinking about building a device that is actually capable of measuring this. For many reasons. You mentioned a few of them, I mentioned some others. The conclusion is the same. So we don't we don't disagree with the conclusions. We may disagree with the way of approaching Still the nuance, the lifetime changes when they are moving. And that is uh, And it changes true. when they are moving, but not so that this formula has been confirmed very well for uniform motion. Yeah. For uniform motion, of course, yes. Well I I don't anyone well if you don't believe in the Lorentz uh, symmetry breaking, then... But yeah, when you talk it. about acceleration, then the acceleration mechanism becomes an extremely important yes. issue. Whereas for uniform motion, you don't need any That's model that's of the force. And here you need the model of the force. Yes. Well, and that is why... So you this model is semi-classical. You cannot avoid answering the question, how do you accelerate the particle? Because accelerating the box is not the same as accelerating the particle. Of course. Well, uh, uh, the box is a, a like special case of a potential, external potential. Right? It's like a ex yeah, sure, but very deep uh, potential. Well, well, you could replace time, it with time, time dependent. Yes, you could replace it maybe with a, uh, with a harmonic potential, and maybe it's but since it's time dependent, dependent, and you are talking about time, I think that this is not the best way to proceed. You are asking questions about time, and then you are using this time-varying situation, which is a hopeless task. Well, uh, the, the good thing about the linear frame of reference is that it does have a, I don't know, you, you may not be a big fan of linear frame of reference, but it does have a well-defined time, the notion of time, because there is a killing vector that is time like in that frame. So in a way, this is a stationary situation in a commoving frame of reference. There is a well-defined notion of time in the uniform accelerated case. I would have more problems talking about non-uniform accelerations, but for that case, I, I, I think I'm quite safe with that one. Yes? yes. Thank you. May I think that this effect comes simply from the fact that these two fields transform differently under acceleration. Because you have one field which is massless and the second is with mass, and therefore they transform differently under the acceleration, and therefore this superposition, which was at the beginning the eigenstate of the whole Hamiltonian, is not the eigenstate in the accelerating frame. This is, well, I haven't seen, shown the explicit calculation, but this is not a problem. I could consider two identical fields if you want. We actually did calculations for two identical <laughs> fields as well, and qualitative things are the same. Only ch what changes is the volume of transformation coefficients slightly, and that, that's all. Really, there's no uh, dramatic change. There's just subtle correction. But uh, you can take, the reason why we did not take uh, massless fields, for example, mm -hmm. is that for massless uh, fields and that type of interaction, you get divergences, infrared divergences. You mm -hmm. have to somehow cut off. So that's the only reason we used mass. And you can take both mass, both fields to be massive. That actually does not change anything. There is, if, uh, there is also a very nice candidate for, uh, for your calculations. If you want to be more realistic, it's the 5 3 theory. That is uh, the story model of QED in tech, many textbooks. Quantum field theory, I, I free interaction theory. It's I a wrong theory. theory. That's not the Brown state. Or is it on five three or five five four five four five four is the five yeah. four. So, but again, the, the transition probably from any is going to change. That is why I did not see But uh, but the general presence of, of the thermal state outside. Oh, I think it's his argument that there are these this two sums, which were involved one, one, one in, in these two Fermi rules. One involved the uh, uh, summation of this uh, modulus squared of amplitudes, and the second the same, plus something. Plus it's something crucial because then, oh yeah, this one. From thermal you, state. Because then you, because then you have to, uh, to prove that for any possible interaction, this term is sign, sign Hyperbolic square vanishes. Okay, so which is proper acceleration. Yes, which is properly uh, very hard to prove that it will uh, for realistic theories. That realistic yes. theories are exactly those for which the sign yes. si hyperbolic side square vanishes. Okay. So what specifically depends on the theory are those coefficients gamma. Yeah. But that general uh, expression does not depend. On
Thank you. I would like to invite everyone.